Well, welcome everyone to our 22nd session of the virtual shadowing program. Tonight, we will be doing a specialty spotlight mm -hmm. on neurology and radiology with Dr. Novakovich White. Next slide, please. Our upcoming sessions will be research in medicine with Dr. Derricks, specialty spotlight on pediatric endocrinology with Dr. Leva, and the following link will be specialty spotlight with pediatrics with Dr. Dutton. And you can join these sessions on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Next slide. And this is our working group. It's composed of myself, Shayan, Taylor, Ani, Rachel, Miriam, Rohit, Elena, and then our physician coordinators, Dr. Ray Fowler, Dr. Brandon Morchetti, and Dr. Gilberto Salzar. And Dr. Salzar will have a update on the virtual observation program <laughs> at the very end of the session. So if you would like to learn more about that, please stay tuned until the very end. Next slide. And we will have two Q and A's during this session, one in the middle and one at the end. So if you have any questions for the presenter, um, please put those in the chat and we will be sure to collect them and present them during those times. And I'm going to give it over to Dr. Fowler to present our speaker for tonight. And next slide, please, Robin. Uh, Robin, next slide, please. Uh, this is the, the next slide that I had. Okay, well, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. It's so good to have you all there from all over the world. Uh, we've had over 28,000 uh, pre-med, pre-PA, and healthcare, pre-healthcare professional students sign up from all over the world, representing 770 universities worldwide. It's an absolute pleasure to continue to be with you these five months. And we're uh, just delighted to have you here with us again this evening for what I think is perhaps one of our most exciting uh, lectures and talks yet. We, we encourage your participation. Please put your questions into chat as we move along. <clears throat> um, tonight, we have a wonderful guest to speak with us. Robin Novakovich White is an associate professor of radiology neurology and neurotherapeutics at UT Southwestern Medical Center and is a member of its neuroradiology division. <clears throat> Dr. Nabokovich White earned her medical degree at Rush Medical College and completed a residency training program in neurology at the University of Chicago Hospital, where she also completed advanced training through a fellowship program in neurocritical care and acute stroke. She then completed additional advanced training in neurovascular surgery through a fellowship program at UT Southwestern, after which she joined the UT Southwestern faculty in 2008. Um, <clears throat> my own work has been a great deal in the pre-hospital environment as we've talked over the last several months. And I've had the distinct pleasure of working with Robin in the pre-hospital area on the identification, management and transport to the appropriate facilities of patients suffering symptoms of acute stroke. It's been an honor for me to work with her and I, it's an absolute honor for me to be on the faculty with someone with this astonishing uh, credentials. So everybody put welcome Dr. Nabokovich White into uh, chat please. And Robin, why don't you take it away? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fowler and Reagan and everyone involved with this virtual uh, shadowing I think it's a wonderful opportunity to introduce uh, people who are interested in going into medicine or people who are already in medical school to allow them to have an exposure to different fields and specialties. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the path that I chose and I wanna let you know that it's okay if your path is a little bit winding and it's not straight to your direct goals. And that's similar to my path. And I'll kind of interject how my life kind of took different turns as I went. Um, but again, my specialties, as Dr. Fowler pointed out, uh, I did a residency in neurology. 
I did fellowship training in neurocritical care, which also included vascular neurology. And then I did additional training to perform procedures in neuroendovascular surgery. So I'm gonna first start off by kind of describing what each of these specialties are, and then I'm gonna really focus on the one where I spend a majority of my time. So the first subspecialty training that I did was for neurocritical care. Now, neurocritical care provides the interface between the brain and other neurological organ systems in the setting of critical illness. So patients are taken care of within a specialized unit. We often call them a neurocritical care unit or a neuro ICU. And these care units specialize in managing the unique needs of critically ill patients with neurological diseases. And so some of the disease processes that we treat in neurocritical care are actually going to overlap some with some of the procedures that I do for neuroendovascular surgery. Now, neurocritical care, you may ask, is this a specialty for you? Well, we typically are going to take care of adult patients in the that are critically ill. It's going to involve a wide spectrum of neurological diseases and problems. At times, it can be fast paced. You're going to use critical thinking, and you really have to have an attention to detail because you're going to want to be looking over all of the things that are pertinent for a patient's, their labs, looking at every organ system and integrating it with the neurological issues as well. There's definitely opportunities for mentoring and teaching. And the important thing that's good about neurocritical care is you have an opportunity to really make a difference, not only for the patients, but also for family members. Because sometimes we deal with neurocritical diseases that have a devastating outcome. And when we can't help the patients, I like to think that in this field, you really have the opportunity to help the family, to help the family come to terms, to understand the disabling disease, and to help them make the right choices in whether to continue care or to move towards comfort measures. Uh, hey, Robin, this is Fowler. Um, we're not seeing your slides. Can you stop sharing and then reshare? We're still stuck on the Q and A slide. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Oh no, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, no, no, no. Please. Let me try again. We we want every single moment of your, of your slides. <laughs> well, I do too, because I put some good slides in here. Um, all right, let me stop sharing. For some reason we're stuck on the Q&A slide. Can you see my slide right now? Robin, I do not. Reagan, speak up, would you please? And Rachel, I see the working group. He unshared, so let's see if we can get it going again. I'm uh, trying one more time. There we are. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Please take it away. No, no. So sorry about that dilemma there. And I'm glad we're back up. Let me know if it goes away again. Um, again, so as I was talking about neurocritical care, what you might not have seen is this video that shows a gentleman who's having a tonic clonic seizure. And some of the issues that we might deal with in the neurocritical care unit are patients that are in status, meaning seizures that we can't get to stop with medications. Now, the next specialty that I did training for that really was rolled into neurocritical care at the time when I did my training was, is vascular neurology. Now, vascular neurology is a specialty that specializes in the caring of patients with cerebral vascular problems. And what that really means is it's involving the blood vessels, whether it be the arteries or the vein in the brain and spinal cord. Vascular neurologists are going to diagnose and treat many cerebral vascular diseases and events, including strokes, or clots like in the veins of the brains or even bleeds in the brains. And you might ask, is vascular neurology the right field for me? Well, things to consider, it will involve adult patients. 
it can at times also be fast paced. Remember the term time is brain, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. You're gonna involve uh, acute treatments, so treatments that have to be done immediately or urgently, but it's also gonna involve primary and secondary prevention of stroke. So it has some inpatient and outpatient components to it. It's gonna allow for mentoring and teaching opportunities. And similar to neurocritical care and neuroendovascular surgery, the decisions and the treatments we do can make the difference between life and death for patients and also influence the amount of disability that patients may have as a result of some of their diseases that they see us for. And in this field, you're gonna also have a high impact to make a difference in a patient's life. Now, the third subspecialty that I'm board certified in is neuroendovascular surgery. Now, neuroendovascular surgery helps to treat complex brain and spinal cord conditions through a minimally invasive procedure that consists of using a very thin and flexible tube, we call a microcatheter or a catheter. And this is inserted through a blood vessel, often through the leg or can be through the arm, to deliver medications, diagnostic uh, dyes or contrasts, or treatments to pathology that's in the brain or spine. And we're gonna really focus on the neuroendovascular surgery uh, as, my, as really my main subspecialty. Now, you may ask, what about neuroendovascular surgery? Is this an opportunity for you? So in neuroendovascular surgery, we're gonna treat both adult and pediatric patients. There are a variety of neurological disease processes that we will be able to treat. It can be fast paced at times. There's definitely mentoring and teaching opportunities. And in this field, what's important to understand is it's a procedural based field. So it's, you're gonna to have to have technical skills, hand-eye coordination, Cases can be complex and it may involve complex decision-making on what is the best treatment modality for a patient. Stakes can be high and you're gonna learn about this as we talk about the field a little bit more. Life and death is also things that can be impacted by the treatments or complications that occur and also disability. We can save patients from disabilities by some of the treatments that we do. You can also have the potential to have a good or high impact in a patient's life. And one of the greatest perks is you can wear scrubs all day long, which is what I live in, if you ask my children. So how do we get here? Well, for neuroendovascular surgery, it's gonna require four years of college. Any major, you're gonna need your pre-medical, uh, pre-med classes, you're gonna need the MCAT. You're then gonna to have to do four years of medical school, but there are really three routes in which you can reach neuroendovascular surgery. The first route is via neurosurgery, and that would be seven years of residency, followed by one to three years of fellowship training in neuroendovascular surgery. The second route that you could go about uh, coming to this position is through radiology. A radiologist completes a five-year residency. Then they will have to do one year of neuroradiology fellowship. And in that fellowship, they're learning to read uh, MRIs and CT scans for neurological diseases. So MRIs of the brain and spine. Then they have to complete two years of a neuroendovascular fellowship. The third route is the route that I took. I did four years of neurology residency. Then you can do either one of two fellowships, neurocritical care, which is two years. And now they have actually pulled vascular out, vascular neurology out into a separate uh, fellowship specialty. And so now in order to do vascular neurology, it's just one year. So you can either choose to do two years of neurocritical care or one year of vascular neurology. And then you have to follow that with a neuroendovascular fellowship for an additional four, uh, two years. So via the neurology route, you're looking at seven to eight years 
for neurosurgery, you're looking at about eight to 10 years of training outside of medical school. And for a radiologist, um, you're basically looking at eight years. As mentioned, I did my medical school at uh, Rush Medical School, and I did my neurology and first fellowship at the University of Chicago. But as I mentioned, I took a little bit of a different route in my training as well. I actually had my first child uh, right before starting medical school. So in my gap year, I had a child and I started medical school because I recognized how difficult medical school would be with a nine month old. The medical college actually allowed me to do medical school in five years. So I took the first year and I actually broke it into two years. And that just allowed me a little bit more time uh, given that I had a very young child. Then in my neurology residency, I actually had a second child and somehow I managed to even have a third child in my neurology residency before starting my um, subspecialty trainings. I then did my neuroendovascular training at UT Southwestern. And then I stayed on as faculty after completing those final two years. So what you can do at your level of training, how can you get to, let's say, neuroendovascular surgery? Well, the route for success is going to involve hard work. There's no way around it. And I'm sure all of you are familiar and right now are working very hard. I would recommend, because things are very competitive for neuroendovascular surgery, that you're participating in research. If it is neurology-based, that would be an advantage. I strongly recommend that you look for mentorship. Um, there are societies that look to mentor patients, or excuse me, people that are looking to go into the field. Uh, one of the societies I'm very active in is called SPIN, the Society of Vascular and Interventional Neurology. We have a very strong mentoring program uh, working with people in medical school or neurology residencies to help guide them through the process so that they can ultimately uh, work in this field. I do recommend volunteering, especially in healthcare related activities, uh, shadowing physicians. Uh, similar to this virtual shadowing that you're doing here. Uh, scribing can also be something that I think can put you in an advantage when you're applying for medical school. And if you are faced with a gap year, aside from all of the things that you're doing and that I talked about, other things to consider is pursuing a master's in that time period or a PhD uh, doing some clinical research. So this is a point where I would open uh, to questions, Reagan. All right, let's see what we got. Well, so. uh, Reagan, while you're looking, let me, let me butt in for a second. <clears throat> so um, Robin, I've had the opportunity to work with you on, on the pre-hospital evaluation and care of uh, stroke patients. And you have been a wonderful leader in North Texas reaching all the way to folks at the EMT level, paramedic level, and so forth to help identify <clears throat> patients. Do you think we're making headway in the pre-hospital identification and care of stroke, or is it still an opportunity for improvement? I think that there is always an opportunity for improvement. I think the field itself is continuing to advance. Just in the last five years, we've had indication for uh, procedures to go in and pull clots out, which I will show you. Um, we've extended the window for treatments, which initially started at six hours. Now we can treat patients all the way out for 24 hours. So it's a continually evolving field. And I think we have made improvements um, in the pre-hospital setting, as well as in the inner facility transfers that take place for patients with stroke. But it, again, it is just a continually progressing field, rapidly progressing. And I think there's always opportunity to continue to learn and advance. Have the neurological symptoms associated with COVID made life easier, harder, whatever for you during this epidemic? So that's a very good question. You know, anecdotally, a lot of us across the nation and even into internationally, uh, some of us noticed that the number of patients that were coming into the emergency room with stroke 
rapidly declined. Now, some areas where they were faced with high volume of COVID cases separately were having issues where they felt that there was a prothrombotic or sticky kind of blood state where patients were maybe more prone to having strokes. But in the areas where we weren't hit with the surge of patients, we tended to see that the numbers of patients going into the hospital declined. And we felt that that may be related to patients or people feeling afraid to go, that they may uh, get COVID. Thank you so much, Reagan. Now take it away with the questions we have so far. Sure. Um, so a lot of the students wanted to know how you decided to choose this route and specifically this specialty. Were there any like situations that you were involved with at a younger age that made you want to choose this specialty? So when I went into medical school, I was interested actually in gynecology and oncology. And I tried to be open-minded as I went through some of my clerkships. You know, I would pay attention to areas that I liked and didn't like. And it was really late in the process. I think it was the beginning of my fourth year. I did my neurology residency. And I just fell in love with the specialty. It was uh, something that appealed to me because it was clinically challenging. You could put together all the subtle nuances of someone's neurological exam and come up with a diagnosis and a localization. It was, to me, something that would be kind of stimulating mentally, which is something I wanted to pursue more. And so uh, even at a late stage, even though I had already put in some of my applications for ob and I had done research and, and kind of had solidified a path for myself, I made a break and I decided to do neurology. Then when I did neurology, I actually found that I liked the critical care aspects of uh, working in the ICU. I liked managing some of the medical illnesses that overlapped with neurocritical care. Um, and from there, I really loved doing procedures, um, placing lines and ventriculostomies, but I found that I wanted something that got me a little bit more uh, involved in the procedures, which then led to neurointerventional, this neuroendovascular surgery. Gotcha. Well, speaking about um, your education and residency, I think a lot of the students are amazed at how you were able to balance starting a family uh, while in medical school and residency. And so um, they want to know how you manage that and how you were able to balance that. So I would say that is very tricky. Um, when you have a child, I think, and you wanna try and pursue your goals and you're gonna be working hard. I think the first epiphany for me was when I recognized, and this may sound silly, but I had to forgive myself for not being perfect because I had to recognize that I had to find a balance and I needed to do my best, which may not always be the best. And at times I would have to focus between my responsibilities of being a neurology resident, uh, trying to pursue neurocritical care, trying to be active there, as well as trying to be the best parent that I could be. Once you realize that your goal is really about doing the best you can be and forgiving yourself when the best may not always be perfect and may be suboptimal sometimes, but other times you can excel and you can do really well. So it's really about learning how to balance, about how, how to keep all your plates spinning and diverting your attention to things when you need it and trying to just remain calm and just trying to know that you have a goal, you'll make it through it. It mm -hmm. always seems to work out no matter what it always did. And you have to, you just have to have a strong, um, I think, belief that you can make it work. And then last week we had a specialty spotlight on psychiatry. So I think that's fresh on everyone's minds. Is there any options that combine psychiatry with neurology and neurosurgery? So that's a good question. 
the board that certifies neurologists is actually combined uh, neurology and psychiatry. And so when you take the neurology boards, you actually do have, I think it's about a third of psychiatry incorporated into it. Um, I do not know of a subspecialty that does not mean that it doesn't exist of a subspecialty that um, combines psychiatry with neurology, but there is an area of neuropsychology where you really focus on cognitive, um, cognitive behaviors and the neurology behind that. Okay, cool. Um, and then a lot of the students on our session right now are pre-PAs, and they wanted to know uh, what's the role that a PA has in um, neurology or radiology, and can they assist you in these types of procedures? So, yes, absolutely. So we have advanced practice providers that work on both the neurocritical care unit as well as on the vascular neurology, and we just started having um, APPs on the neuroendovascular service. So in the ICU, in the neurocritical care, I can tell you that the APPs are able to do procedures like placing lines. Um, they are very good, excellent actually, at doing some of the catheters like central lines, arterial lines, um, even LPs. APPs can be trained, <clears throat> excuse me, to do some procedures. Um, they cannot interpret films. So I know in uh, VIR, which is kind of body IR, uh, some of the APPs actually do procedures like thyroid biopsies, et cetera. In neuroendovascular, the procedures are more complex, and I'll show you some of it. So, you know, aside from getting groin access, um, it's going to be limited how much they can do. Okay. Perfect. I think that we are good for now. I think we can go ahead and keep going if you want. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what's, what's involved in the day of a life of someone who does neuroendovascular surgery? All right. So I'm going to start by just kind of describing what is it. it to begin with, we're really performing angiograms uh, and procedures using fluoroscopy or radiation. So as you see here, it's a sterile procedure. The patient is draped. Uh, we basically spend our time staring at the screens, the monitors that show us the live fluoro. We are gonna typically gain access into an artery in the leg um, and then use the wires and catheter which show up under x-ray as we guide it through the vascular uh, pathway through the body. Now, sometimes we might gain access in the arm or even down here at the wrist in the radial artery. And very rarely, we might actually need to gain access in the carotid artery if someone has occlusion of the aorta or we can't get through the arm. So very rarely, we'll do a direct carotid stick. After we've gained access, we're basically working with our biplane machines. So we have one tube, which is in the front or top of the patient. We call this the AP tube, and it'll produce images like this, a straight on view. And when we inject contrast, the blood vessel basically lights up. After the bone is subtracted away, all you see is the blood vessel. We then have another tube on the side. This is called the lateral tube. And this is produces an image like this. Again, a side view with the contrast as it rolls through the blood vessel. The eyes would be over here, the nose right here, and the ear right here. Now, sometimes we do what's called a 3D rotational image. And this is a better look at the blood vessel where we can actually see it in a 3D reconstruction. And so you can kind of watch and see the face as it's rotated around as the tube is rotating around the patient. It's important in this field that you're gonna to have to have a very detailed understanding of the blood vessels, the arteries that supply the brain and the brain tissue itself. You have to understand what is the role or responsibility of all of the individual brain tissues and the blood vessels supply to that brain tissue. 
And the reason that it's important to know this is because the injury in a blood vessel, it will be classic to a certain territory. And that territory will translate into neurological deficits. So the arteries that are involved, for example, in a stroke are gonna translate into the symptoms that a patient will manifest if they have a blockage in the artery to that territory. So some of the angiograms that we do are merely for diagnostic purposes. So we may do an image and we wanna define the pathology. This will help us to identify what might be some of the treatment uh, decisions or treatment plan for a patient. Because sometimes we have options between an open surgery or an endovascular route to treatment. And here is an example, um, excuse me, let me go back. Here is an example of an arteriogram uh, performed in an artery to the spine. And there's an abnormality here called an AVM. Now, some of the pathology we see is similar to the blockage that people get in the heart. You can get the same type of blockage in the arteries in the neck. This is called a carotid stenosis. And as I mentioned, there are different treatment options. One treatment would be to go and have an open surgery where they actually produce an arterotomy or a slit through the artery. And then the surgeon, a vascular surgeon or a neurosurgeon would go in and actually remove the plaque and then suture the artery back. But another option is one that I do, which is an endovascular treatment for the plaque. So this is procedure is guided all through the artery. It's a minimally invasive procedure. So we would start off by traversing or going past the stenosis. We place what's called a distal protection device in the artery. And then we may use a combination of a balloon or stent to open the artery up and try and keep it open. Some of the stents are balloon mounted. So you inflate the balloon and then the stent pushes the plaque back and you end up leaving the stent there. And then other stents, we do a process of unsheathing it. So we bring the microcatheter up and then we bring the microcatheter back while pinning the wire and this deploys a stent. And then we have to come back up and inflate a balloon to expand the stent and try and push that plaque open. And so here's an example of a patient with a carotid stenosis. This is the pre on the left. And this is the post after treatment. And you can see our guide catheter sitting here in the artery. Now, similar to plaque buildup that happens in the neck, we can also get it up into the brain. This is called ICAD or intracranial atherosclerotic disease. And this intracranial atherosclerotic disease can sometimes be treated by a similar angioplasty and stenting First line of treatment though is aggressive medical management. And if they fail that, then we can offer stenting and angioplasty. And so for this type of procedure, again, it's very similar. We inflate a balloon, we're gonna deploy a stent, and then we may come back and actually angioplasty again. So here's a tight narrowing in an artery right here. This is up into the brain and an artery we call the MCA. This is that AP view I showed you the front on, and this is a lateral, and you can see that stenosis, that narrowing right here. If you notice the contour of the vessel changes. And again, we go up and we can do a treatment. And so this is what it looks before treatment, and this is what it looks after. And you can almost make out the stent that's sitting in the artery there. And this is the front on view. This is the pre, and here is the post. Now, sometimes patients can also develop what's called a carotid blowout. And again, I'm just gonna kind of introduce you to some of the disease processes that we treat. So some patients have an injury in that carotid artery and it starts bleeding. And this can be a life-threatening uh, situation where a patient can bleed out and die within a few minutes. And unfortunately, I've had two patients that couldn't make it to the table for me to treat because the bleeding was so profound. So in these patients, we can do things like placing a covered stent or even sacrificing the blood vessel. 
Now, sometimes arteries may bleed because of trauma or aneurysms that rupture into the brain. Another thing that we may see is called a carotid cavernous fistula. And this is where one of the arteries up in the brain uh, develops a hole and has this abnormal communication with some of the veins in the brain. And what can develop is what we see here, which is a carotid cavernous fistula. So we should see just this artery. And what you see here is some of this abnormal venous filling. Well, unfortunately, when patients have carotid cavernous fistulas, they can develop uh, blurred vision or even vision loss. They can have headaches, double vision. They can develop this edema around the eye and the eye can actually bulge out. Uh, quite considerably, which can be very painful for the patient. So one of the first line treatments for fistulas when they develop is an endovascular procedure. And in the endovascular procedure, we can either choose to come up through the artery or the vein. And what we do is we bring these very small microcatheters up through the hole in the artery when that is the cause, and then we can start packing off the vein to seal the hole with coils. And so here's an example of a fistula that was treated. And these are the coils that shut down the fistula. And again, this has a potential of saving someone's vision. And sometimes some of this abnormal venous filling can actually put them at risk for bleeding in the brain. So you can really make a tremendous difference in someone's life if you can treat their fistula. And here is an example of a patient's fistula who was treated and then after treatment, how his symptoms resolved. Again, here is another example of a patient where they were treated with a special type of stent called a flow diverting stent. And so instead of going through the hole, now we place these newer flow diverting stents which redirect the flow away from the hole. And it can be just the first line treatment in these patients. And this is kind of an image of what the stent looks like in the vessel. And again, it can cure a fistula for some patients. So the exciting thing about this field, it is continually advancing. Just in the time that I've been doing this field, uh, flow diverters have come out, new techniques, new coils, new stents. It is continually advancing and it's really an exciting field to be in. Um, here's an example of a patient that I treated that had a trauma that led to multiple injuries and an injury that led to the fistula. And again, we come through the venous side on this patient. We pack it off with coils, closing that hole, and then the Basically, the artery then looks better um, and there's no further fistula and it resolves some of their symptoms. Sometimes if there's difficulty in getting into the vein or through the hole, sometimes it's really a collaborative effort and we may involve either neurosurgery to open a direct access for us to stick our catheters in, or even ophthalmology might open an access for us to get to the vein in the eye so that we can feed our catheters through backwards and then deposit the coils. Now, another pathology that we see are aneurysms. Um, aneurysms are like blisters or bubbles that form on the blood vessel. When they're in the brain cavity in the intracranial space, which we call the subarachnoid space, they are at risk of causing a life-threatening hemorrhage called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So there's different routes to treat aneurysms. You can do a direct open approach like here, which is a craniotomy going in and placing clips. This is what a neurosurgeon would do with clips. But there's also an endovascular route to treatment where we can actually come up with our microcatheters, get into the aneurysm through the blood vessel and bring coils. And so here's an aneurysm untreated and here's one treated with coils. It's really hard to even see it. And so here is kind of a, a drawing of demonstrating what we do. Uh, we always guide our catheters with wires and we bring the wire into the aneurysm then follow that with our catheter. We remove the wire and then we would bring coils and we basically uh, deliver the coils in a Russian doll technique we talk about, where you put in a framing coil and then you bring up additional coils until you have 
sealed as much off of the aneurysm so that blood flow can't get in there. And here again is an example of an aneurysm. Remember I said it's like a blister or a bubble on the blood vessel. And here is that aneurysm treated again. Now, aneurysms I wish were always super easy to treat like these where we could just primarily coil them, but they are not. Some are aneurysms are more complicated than others. And that becomes some of the decision-making, what is the best treatment? Is it an open surgical approach or is it an endovascular? And as I mentioned, we have newer and better devices and catheters that allow us to treat endovascularly more and more complex aneurysms. And so sometimes we utilize a stent as part of the treatment to help hold the coils in place. Sometimes we might use a balloon that we intermittently inflate to protect the parent artery right here while we're delivering coils into the aneurysm. But we have more and more uh, stents that are available that allow us again to treat more complicated lesions. And so new stents are coming out literally every year. And here is an example of a very large complicated aneurysm that when I first started my treat, uh, training, we didn't really have great treatments aside from sacrificing the blood vessel. Well, now we have these flow diverting stents, which I talked to you about. And so rather than placing coils, a stent can actually redirect the flow away from the aneurysm and thereby decreasing the flow into the aneurysm and serve as a means of primary treatment for an aneurysm. There are different flow diverting stents. I believe there is now three on the market here in the US. There might be a fourth, I lose track. Um, but again, it's continually evolving and changing. And so here is that aneurysm and you can kind of make out the microcatheter here going through the blood vessel. And you may be able to see the flow diverting stent that's now in the blood vessel in the parent artery. And what happens when we use these flow diverting stents is you get this initial delay or stagnation in the flow in the aneurysm. But over time, it will remodel. And so for example, in this patient, after four months, the artery looked to have no aneurysm. So this is the pre and this is the post. And here is the side view of the same artery. And here's the post. Again, there's newer devices. This one, instead of placing coils, you can actually place a cage-like device in the artery. And this one is, I would consider a game changer that's new in this out. And this is uh, making treatments a lot easier than all of the coils that we initially would deliver. Um, but not all aneurysms can be treated by this route. Here's one aneurysm. And here's after placing the web device. So not all can be treated by this route, but when they are, it is a, uh, a very uh, simple approach. It's more simple than some of the other techniques. So here is a CT scan. And what I'm showing you is an aneurysm, both in the posterior circulation and one in the anterior circulation. And we're gonna take a look at this patient um, who had their aneurysm treated. So in the posterior circulation, when we have aneurysm, it's a lot more complicated and there isn't great uh, surgical options because to do surgery often may create more problems or disabilities than the natural history of the aneurysm. And so endovascular treatments in the posterior circulation for some of the posterior circulation treatments is better treated by endovascular approaches. And so here's an aneurysm that was treated with an endovascular approach um, that initially had some recurrence after treatment and required another treatment with a flow diverting stent. And as you can see, that resolved the aneurysm that was there. And here is a 3D rotational look of the aneurysm that was treated. You can see how it was initially treated with coils and then ultimately received a treatment later on with a flow diverting stent after it had become available. Now, 
as I'm going to talk to you a little bit now, not everything, not all treatments go as well as we would want. And so this is where maybe some of the negatives of the field come into play. I mentioned that the stakes are high, and they are. We are working in the brain and spine where small injuries to blood vessels can translate to strokes, neurologic disability, and sometimes even into death. So this patient that I showed you that was treated actually developed a small medullary stroke, so a stroke in the brainstem, and they developed some symptoms that improved over time, but produced some disability early on. So this kind of leads us into complications and the negatives of the field. So, you know, one of the negatives is maybe the lifestyle. You know, when we talk about treating strokes, uh, it occurs at any hour of the day, nighttime, weekends. You really, you're going to be responsible for uh, taking part in call. And so for our group, we have the luxury of having six providers and we share that call. It ends up being, though, about a third of my year is spent on call for endovascular surgery. Um, and remember that some of these treatments are very time sensitive, like a carotid blowout or a stroke. So you have to treat urgently. You've got to rush out of bed to get into the hospital to treat patients. And as I kind of alluded to in the other uh, patient that I presented, not all patients do well. And sometimes we have complications and sometimes those complications can be life-threatening or lead to severe disability. But of course, we never wanna do procedures where the risk of the procedure outweighs the potential for benefit. So even in thrombectomies, even though we have a risk of somewhere about six to 10% risk of complication, the benefit is there and that patients will be able to have a better outcome, um, achieve low to no disability following a stroke in about 40 to 50% of the patients that we treat compared to those that have no treatment where when they have a large vessel occlusion, their disability can be in their chances, I'm sorry, of a good recovery can be as low as 10 to 20 percent. So what are the positives then? I've showed you some of the procedures we do. I've talked to you about some of the negatives, but what are the real positives of this field? And for that, I'm going to talk to you about ischemic stroke. Certainly there are many other uh, procedures that we do that have positive outcomes, but this is one where I have an example to show you. So this is a patient that's going to have an M1 occlusion, so a blockage, a clot that sits in the artery, and you can see all of the blood vessels that are missing right here. This is the patient I showed you earlier that's having a stroke. Ready? Let's uh, get everyone to mute themselves, please. All right, so this patient actually has a stroke involving an artery on the right side of her brain in an artery we call the middle cerebral artery. And you can tell that neurologically, she is neglecting the, right, the left side of her body and she actually has weakness involving the left arm. And so just from the clinical exam alone, I can predict where the clot is sitting. Now, sometimes it can be confusing. There's some overlap with clots that sit in the back, the posterior circulation, but usually we can predict where the clot would sit and whether it's in a large artery or a small uh, vessel disease. So the procedures that we would do for a patient with a clot is called mechanical thrombectomy. And in these procedures, we come up and we may either use a retrievable stent or a catheter that does aspiration and can actually suck the clot out, or we do a combination of both. And what this illustration is showing you is a stent that's gonna be deployed. And so here we're bringing, or well, in this animation, they're bringing the stent up and you can see the stent there. And now they're gonna actually pull the catheter back, which actually deploys the stent in the clot. 
and we let it sit there for a couple minutes because what happens is the clot kind of wraps itself into the interstices of the stent. And then we bring a catheter up with aspiration, uh, sometimes without, and we're gonna actually bring the stent into the, the catheter here. And then that allows us to bring the clot out of the body. So here is our patient that had the M1 occlusion, the blockage is right there. You can see our catheter up here, which will be used for aspiration, our small microcatheter, which is now through the clot. A stent is deployed. And here again is our pre. And here is after the stent is pulled out. And here is an example of some of the clot that we pull out. Uh, this is the stent and you can see on the stent how the clot gets kind of wrapped into the interstices of the stent. So here is the patient, this is her final outcome. She had a small stroke compared to what she could have had if we had not gotten the clot out. And she was actually able to leave the hospital with normal strength on the left walk and have clear thinking and lead a normal life. And here she How is. You? I'm doing great, thanks to you. Can you raise up your hand? Sure. Both of them. They seem to be working pretty well. Right. I can walk too. You can walk? Yeah. And oh, I wow. can talk. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> it is. That's wonderful. Great. I'm glad you're doing that. All right. So that is your introduction to neuroendovascular surgery. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer whatever I can. Robin, what an amazing talk. I, so, God, what, what courage you have to have to go up inside these skinny vessels of someone who is now abruptly hemiplegic to rescue them. Where did this courage come from? <laughs> <laughs> Training. So I think, you know, as you go and you have excellent mentors and training, you build confidence along the way. You know, at the beginning, anything will seem like it's impossible or scary to accomplish, even trying to pursue medical school. But as you go, if you believe in something and you're passionate, you just have to believe in the process. And again, surround yourself by good training and mentors. And then you get there. Do you find yourself from time to time having to be flexible? You may start a procedure in one way and then realize that there, perhaps there are complications or the device that you've chosen is not optimal and, and that you have to change in midstream? Oh, absolutely. So there are times where we call it flailing. We'll spend maybe six hours in an endovascular procedure trying to get to the point where we need to treat, but we can't maybe get our catheters there or we can't get the stent there. And I showed you an example of how sometimes we actually have to do direct exposures. So there are cases that are just very complicated and we have to step back and we have to rethink, how can we do this? Do we need to do a carotid stick in order to get to the carotid if the aorta is occluded? Or maybe endovascular isn't gonna end up being the best route and it needs to be combined or it needs to pursue a open surgical approach. You know, for, for cardiology, we have an electrocardiogram which tells us a great deal of what we need to know for the acute coronary syndrome. We don't have an EKG or ECG for the brain. So, what are the challenges about training our pre-hospital providers and for that matter, our emergency physicians about recognizing patients that may be suffering acute stroke? So you're absolutely right. In the field, um, in the pre-hospital setting and that very early onset when you're evalu evaluating a patient that comes into the ED, the only thing we have is the neurological exam. And that is part of what I fell in love with in this field you can look at, again, all of those subtle nuances of the exam, neglect, aphasia, right-sided weakness, and you can turn that into a localization of what you think is impacted or involved, and that can help you to diagnose. 
is this a clinic, could this be a stroke? So in the pre-hospital setting, we use what are called stroke screening tools and stroke severity tools. And they are basically these rapid neurologic assessments for an EMS provider to try and pick up if this patient could be having a stroke and then to try and discern, is it a uh, large vessel occlusion, which is the most severe stroke? So I've been in medicine 47 years and it's been astonishing to watch the changes and what we can do. How quickly in, in your brief career, well, medium brief career, Robin, have you watched technology change and, and, and thus having to keep up for new devices, new techniques and so forth? Are, are you seeing um, uh, quite a bit of a sea change in, in neurology? Absolutely. I think this is a rapidly growing field. So if you're someone that likes to be at the forefront of medicine, likes to you know, learn the latest devices, may even have creative ideas and wants to be involved in being a pioneer. This is definitely that field. Um, from the time I started, we had low diverting stents. And some of the aneurysms when I first started that we didn't have great treatments for, now we do. So as time goes on, I think the field of endovascular is gonna broaden um, the things that we can treat. There's uh, intrafecal or intra-arterial uh, rate, um, chemo agents that can be used. There's stem cells that are being delivered. I mean, there's a lot of investigational stuff that over time I think is will or will not, but is going to advance the field into new areas for treatments, even beyond what I'm showing. you. So are you optimistic about the future um, in your field for the treatment of cancer in the, in the, in the brain especially? So it is something that, you know, the intra-arterial delivery of chemo drugs it directly to the tumors is kind of, I think, in its early development. I think that at the moment, there's some that don't see the use of it and others that are trying to pioneer the field. Um, I, I think it's something to stay tuned to and, and see where that evolves. There's, you know, there's other greater things that they're doing. Um, they're talking about these lead placements in some of the sinuses for um, epilepsy monitoring, for, for looking at, you know, to replace like an EEG or as an adjunct to the EEG. So again, it's a rapidly evolving field with so many um, new opportunities for treatments that, uh, you know, stay tuned because I think it will just continue to grow and change. Speaking of changing, when a new procedure comes out, how do you practice? I mean, are, are there simulation techniques, mannequins that you can practice on? Yes, absolutely. Any new device, you're going to obtain training by first working on a flow model. Then they proctor you. So you're going to do the procedure after the initial training with an expert in the field who comes in and proctors you while you're doing it. So they'll give advice. They don't scrub in, but they're going to watch over your shoulder and kind of give you some advice as you're maybe deploying one of the new stents. Um, some of them are intuitive and some of the stents are very similar to one another. So there isn't much of a learning curve or between the two because uh, you already have that basic knowledge. Um, but then after you have an initial amount of proctoring, then you're gonna start being able to do the procedures yourself. And if you do enough of them, you can actually become a proctor yourself. Wonderful. Reagan, uh, do you have other questions that have come up for Dr. Novakovich? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of the students wanted to know how you deal with unexpected problems during surgery that require you to fall require you to figure out alternate solutions. So um, I think the important thing when you're in a procedural field, you will always have to face potential for complications. And even in medicine, you know, in the emergency room or for an internist, there's always a chance you might miss a diagnosis. And so one of the things I teach our fellows, when a complication occurs, number one, you wanna try and stay calm. You wanna try and think right away, you wanna have in your back mind, what are you gonna do? 
So for example, if I'm going to be treating an aneurysm, I'm gonna have a coil on the table ready to go in case there's a perforation. So you wanna to start to develop you know, your, your triage process. What are you gonna to do to treat this problem? And then when a complication occurs, you wanna take a moment after the procedure to also, to, as a healing part, to turn that negative into something that you can learn from. What could have you done differently? What could have changed that outcome so that you may not have had that complication? And I think what's also helpful after a complication is remember you have a patient and family member that have to live with the consequences of a complication. So I think it's equally healing for the proceduralist to be involved, to work with the family, to work with the patient on coping or dealing with a complication that may have had some negative consequences. And then a lot of the students had questions on stents. Um, so the first one of probably many is when using stents, is there a risk of an immune reaction against the foreign object leading to further damage? So that's, that's a good question. Um, most of the stents that we use, we really have not found that there are any um, immune reactions to it. What we found is that they do want to form clots when they are initially deployed in the body. The platelets recognize the stent as foreign. And so to prevent that from happening, we use antiplatelet medications. We'll use two, like aspirin and Plavix. And even before the procedure, we'll test their blood to make sure they are responding to those medicines to try and lower that risk of complication for clot from forming. And we will use potent blood thinners during the procedure. After the procedure, once the stent is in place, then they will remain on those dual antiplatelets for a period of time, depending on if it's a flow diverter or uh, just a regular stent. Uh, that may be between six weeks, six weeks to six months. Um, often many fall within the three month period. Gotcha. Okay, so the second question on stents is, um, does stenting cause arterial rupture or damage and how often? So the stent itself, in terms of its deployment, does not often injure the artery. The things that might injure the artery are the catheter wire as you're coming up through the artery. The wire in particular can be a source of injury. Um, if you're inflating a balloon for like a um, stenosis, that can sometimes cause dissections in the artery. The stent itself is very soft. Um, the ones that we use in the neck have a little bit more radial force, so they're a little bit stiffer but the ones that go into the brain are extremely soft. Um, and I'm sorry, we're not in person. I often bring with me some of the devices so people can feel them. And then can anything dislodge the stent, like high blood pressure? So if the stent is not properly sized for the blood vessel, then it can move. But if you have properly sized the stent, then it should be well opposed to the blood vessel wall and will not move. And actually over time, the stent really starts the, I would say the blood vessel starts to actually grow a wall, an intimal layer and incorporate that stent into the vessel wall over time. Okay, so we're done with stents. Um, a lot of the students were curious, what is the most common way for an aneurysm to form? Well, that's another good question. Um, the risk factors for intracranial aneurysms can be from things that are modifiable to things that are not modifiable. So there are certain ethnicities, Japanese, Inuit, Eskimo, and Finnish, that have a higher risk of aneurysms and aneurysms that rupture. Um, things that are modifiable include smoking, blood, um, elevated blood pressure or hypertension. Certain drug use can do it, especially ones that um, are, have amphetamine-based. Uh, also excessive alcohol. 
And then there can be family history. Um, there can be uh, instances where there may be a genetic leak, or it may be that family members share comorbidities like high blood pressure or smoking, and this predisposes um, to have intracranial aneurysms. And then there can be some genetic diseases like polycystic kidney disease, and there's some others that have risk of intracranial aneurysms. Perfect, thank you. And then how many procedures do you do per day or per week? So I would say, and it depends on how you design your, your career. So um, if you are a majority of your time procedurally based, um, you may end up doing maybe three, one to three cases in a day, maybe more. Um, if you have kind of a hybrid model to your career where you're doing some neurocritical care um, or you're doing some administrative duties like quality or taking on roles like in the rack, then you might have uh, more of a kind of a hybrid where you're doing procedures three days out of the week instead of uh, five. And I think uh, with these procedures through television shows, it's kind of been depicted that you have to have very naturally steady hands. Um, is this true? And if so, is there a way to train your hands to be more steady? So with endovascular procedures, um, you know, the steady hands, I think, play less than when you're doing something like maybe neurosurgery. With endovascular procedure, it's really all about manipulating catheters and a wire. So you have to have good dexterity. You have to have good hand-eye coordination because you're watching a screen and moving your catheter and wire while your hands are moving down here. Um, but actually, there are robotic devices that are coming into play now where you actually load the catheter and wire into a robotic device which then advances the microcatheter and wire while you're toggling um, some controls. And again, this is another area where things could advance. And the idea, the concept, I think, as they're developing this would be an interventionalist could be sitting at one hospital, but treating a stroke in a rural area uh, through this device. So someone with some training would have to be at the stroke center, gaining access, loading everything into the robotic arm, but the neurointerventionalist then could be sitting at a screen with controllers and you know, deploying the stent, moving the catheter, et cetera. So- Tom, let, me, let me interject there. Um, so do you see the, um, the continuing advance of artificial, or as I say, assisted intelligence uh, to be a benefit in your field? Yes, absolutely. So artificial intelligence right now is being used to interpret some of the images that we look at. So the way we select patients for stroke is based on their imaging. We use a CT of the head, CT angiogram, which looks at the blood vessels on a CT scan, and then also CT perfusion. And the artificial intelligence is actually so good now that it can interpret the image um, within minutes of the patient receiving the, the imaging. And now they deliver that to our phones on an app. So I can pull up my app, I get alerted that there's a large vessel occlusion, I open the app, I look, I can scroll through the images. And sometimes the AI is not 100% um, um, uh, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, but it does a very good job. So AI, I think, is going to continue to play a role in this field, and it's already in terms of patient selection. We certainly feel that way in emergency medicine. Um, in the ER, of course, we see every emergencies of all ages, of all genders, at all hours, uh, of all diseases. And so for us, you know, to, to have the command of information that's available is just frankly difficult at times. And so we certainly anticipate the rise of assisted intelligence with the passing of time to help us with differential diagnoses. You, you may not have seen a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura in a long, long time, and you, might, you just might not think of it. So we're looking forward to having that kind of assisted intelligence. 
Yeah. Um, Reagan, what else do you have? I have a question if I might, Dr. Novakovic. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the, um, a lot of these procedures don't always have the outcome that uh, you might expect for patients or that patients wish um, may not be 100% recovery in terms of stroke. How do you speak with patients about managing expectations before a procedure like this and discussing the risk benefits and potential kind of full recovery versus partial recovery versus no recovery at all? So the first thing I would emphasize is remember that the moment that this is happening to either a patient or a family member, they are overwhelmed. And there's only so much they're going to be able to kind of absorb at that time that you're talking to them. So I like to keep it very simple. I like to just talk about the risk to benefits. Um, in four thrombectomy procedures, you know, the evidence shows us, the recommendations are telling us that patients with this type of stroke do better if we attempt to try. And then you have to lay out the expectations too. There's a chance that they could get worse. There's a chance that they may get better. And there's a chance that it may not improve their condition at all. Despite that, the the potential for benefit is far greater than the risk of the procedure. So keep it very simple. And then let them know how you did after the procedure. We got the blood vessel open, but you know we're gonna have to wait to see how they do. When someone is recovering from stroke, one of our greatest indicators of how they're going to do is their rate of recovery. So if someone wakes up and they've had improvement and they're significantly better, we know that down the road, they're going to make a good recovery, most likely so long as they don't have any other medical issues or another stroke. And so you try and walk them through the process. And, and I think the thing that's most helpful for them is trying to keep it into perspective, that the most we can do is take it one day at a time. Don't try and predict too far out. Don't try and think where you're gonna be in six months just yet. You have to get through the acute period and take it one day at a time and then kind of walk them through that, uh, letting them know if you see improvements each day, how the patient looks, and for then being able to better predict, you know, what six months might look like, what, what the patient might be, look, be able to achieve in a year. Reagan, do we have any other questions for Dr. Novakovic? Uh, yes. So you are a very busy doctor, um, but do you also have time to do research on the side? Oh, yes. If you want to do academic medicine, um, I think, you know, research has to be something that you're passionate about as well, because you want to, if you're active in research, you know, if you're someone who wants to advance the field. So the beautiful thing about doing clinical research is you can incorporate it really in what you're doing already. Um, some do uh, bench research where they're trying to advance the field, developing catheters or new devices. For myself, I tend to focus on doing some of the um, clinical research where you're looking at you know, the benefit of some of the treatments or some of the devices or trying to find new ways for trying to triage patients through the ED to help identify strokes more rapidly. Reagan, perhaps one or two more questions and then I think we'll begin to wrap up. Um, sounds good to me. Um, how does your background in radiology um, assist you while operating and treating? So, <clears throat> My background in radiology is really um, only in the two years that I did neuroendovascular surgery. My primary specialty is neurology. But in those two years that I did neuroendovascular surgery, you're learning um, radiology in terms of fluoroscopy. You're learning how to be conservative about the radiation doses that you're delivering. Um, you're learning how to interpret angiography. Now, in your training in neurology, you're going to become comfortable at looking at CT scans of the head and, and the spine, um, MRIs as well, and some of the diagnostic imaging that's involved 
to um, help identify and uh, outline treatment plans. And I think this will be our last question. Um, for any pre-med students or pre-PA or pre-health students who are interested in the field of neurology, radiology, do you have any advice for them on what they should be looking into right now or things that they should be doing? If they're interested in radiology, Reagan, did you say? Neurology or radiology. So I would say if you are in pre-med and you think that you might have an interest in this field, um, number one, I'm going to say is what's most important is be sure you stay open-minded because as you go through your education, you may change your mind like I did, where I started off thinking I was going to do gynecology and obstetrics, and I changed my mind at the last minute. And that was only because I allowed myself that opportunity to question, did I really want this field or did I like something better? So always, even though you think you might want something, be open-minded to maybe changing your mind or discovering a new field you had never considered. But if you are interested in neurology, I would recommend that you look for participating in research. I think that research is very important to um, make your application more appealing. Um, it shows a level of interest and in someone who's invested in working hard and in pursuing um, that field. So I think looking for research is very important. And most important is also looking for mentorship, trying to find someone that is in the field or in a similar field, looking for their guidance. It also may open up opportunities for research projects that you could participate in. Robin, what a, what a wonderful talk. I, I was just, <laughs> if, you were, if you were asked, with a pencil and a piece of paper, could you draw the arterial anatomy that you showed us tonight? I mean, do you have it so well in? in... Oh yeah, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually a two hour lecture on just the cerebrovascular anatomy. I can and do that with the carpal bones of the wrist, but not the cerebral anatomy. So. Um... Robin Novakovich White, what an astonishing revelation and sharing of your amazing training and experience. Robin, tonight, 1,300 people were online listening to you live, and just what a great, great session we've had. I want to ask everybody to put thank you into chat so that uh, Dr. Novakovich can uh, see your thank yous. We are so uh, enamored with you, and you have just really lifted us so high to see the great peak uh, of what medicine can, can do and can be. Uh, we cannot thank you enough. And uh, Robin, um, I'll say to you that around 5,000 people will look at this video. Uh, that's what usually happens. Each one of them will probably see 100,000 patients in their lifetime, in their career. And so tonight through your wonderful talk, Robin, you will have reached probably a half a billion lives. So we, we just cannot thank you enough for your kindness, for taking the time. I saw your email from two o'clock this morning. You obviously worked so hard. So again, on behalf of the Virtual Shadowing Working Group and all of us in the virtual shadowing world, we thank you so very much. Um, now, I believe we have a couple more slides. Uh, Gil Salazar, you have something you want to share with us, right? I think we can go over the assessment first and then we'll have Dr. Salazar talk. Oh, Dr. Do you mind um, resharing your slide just for the last quick slide? Perfect, okay. So the Quest-based assessment is not up yet, so you will not be able to access it. We will open it probably about 30 or 40 minutes after this session um, ends, but this is the information for it. We will make sure to post it on our Instagram, on our website, and you will be receiving it in the email tomorrow. And you don't need a Questbase account to take the assessment. Make sure to use dashes in the pin, and it is due next Tuesday at 6.59 p.m. Central Time. So if you want to go to the next slide, 
think Dr. Salzer has, yes. Okay, Dr. Salzer, you can take it away. Hey guys, good evening. Good seeing you all again. Um, we've been getting a lot of interest on um, the sister program for virtual shadowing. It's gonna be called UT Southwestern Virtual Clinical Observation Program uh, or VCOP. So this is gonna be a spinoff of this virtual shadowing uh, program. We heard you, you want more experiences. So we're gonna bring you something that's a little bit different. Um, it's still really, really cool. It's gonna be based on simulation medicine using standardized patients, um, actual recorded uh, procedures, patient encounters, and moderated by professional educators like myself and some of our, our faculty. So I've been posting a lot of stuff on my uh, IG account. So go there, I can put it in the chat there toward the end. And uh, because you all were so nice um, in being pre-registering and telling us that you wanted this, we uh, put a, a little video together for you uh, for a preview. So let's see if uh, Shayan can take it away. All right, so I have the video pulled up here. Uh, if everyone in this call would actually please um, turn your video off if, if that's okay I think that may cause a little bit of delay uh, in the video but let me go ahead and share my screen um, oh yeah I think I, Dr. Uh, Novakovic wants to uh, unshare her screen thank you okay there we go all right do y'all see it yes we do show you oh perfect um, so let me just take a quick listen to your heart and lungs because I am concerned about the kind of chest pain that you're having and I certainly do want to get that checked out, okay? Oh, I think this is really probably nothing. I, you know, I hope so, but better safe than sorry. All right, big deep breaths for me, okay? Good. All right, and now just kind of relax and breathe normally for me. I'm gonna to listen to your heart. All right, I am hearing a bit of a murmur on you. Have we heard that on you before? You haven't mentioned that before. I don't think I have. Did you miss it last time? You know, either I missed it or it's something new, which is a little bit worrisome to me. And your heart rate's pretty fast. Your pulses are a little bit thready. Um, so let's get you into an exam room and get this uh, workup going for you, okay? Come follow me. There you have it. Okay. All right, guys, that was a nice little preview for you. So that shows you a little bit about what we're gonna be doing. We're also gonna be putting together some work on virtual reality, et cetera. So it's gonna be really cool. The website is being put together as well as our learning management system. So go to my IG, uh, the pre-registration is there to show your interest. And once the website is up, you will be able to sign up. We're gonna be charging a little bit to cover the cost of the program and the technology and everything and the certificates. So it's gonna be one heck of a program. We're gonna go live. Um, around mid-November or so. So stay tuned, we're putting in a lot of work. It's really exciting and we're looking forward to seeing you. Thank you so much, Gil. Well, on behalf, behalf of the entire virtual shadowing working group, we are just so pleased that you could join us tonight, all 1300 of you that were live with us. We will be here next week with another wonderful program for you and we will be here as long as you keep coming back. So on behalf of the entire team and Dr. Novakovic, we want to just thank you for coming and we wish you a good evening. Good night.